Let's move on to some of the other things that are happening in the middle of the global pandemic, like finding yourself out of a job. Must be frustrating and frightening. There has been news this week of yet another scheme to help younger people back into employment, but it's actually the over 50s who've seen the largest rate rise in unemployment here in the South East. Marcella Whittingdale has more. Limited to looking online, Jane Young's been trying every avenue to find work from her flat in Bex Hill. Ideally, she'd like a job in admin. It's a good six hours sort of surfing. Not every day, but I mean, I've got to be truthful. There are days when I got so disheartened. Whereas I used to like to speak to people, you can't speak with people. It's all done by application, on by email. I feel quite desperate sometimes insofar as I just want to settle down for the next few years because I'm going to have to work till I'm 66. I've got another birthday coming soon, so it's not going the right way. The clock is going forwards. The latest data collected between last September and November estimated there were around 46,000 people aged between 50 and 64 unemployed here in the South East. That's compared with 30,000 at the same time in 2019 and a rise in the rate of unemployment in this age group of just over 50%. Unemployed himself for 15 years, Stuart Avery now works for Social Enterprise Kent, helping other people back into work. In his experience, what job seekers over 50 most need is help with technology and self-worth. Due to the COVID pandemic, it's self-confidence, um, there's lots of anxiety, but it's, um, we're all in the same boat and it's, um, if you ask for help, there is support there. It's, um, we will work on what, what's needed from CVs, job applications, cover letters, um, upskilling, training, self-employment. We help people with redundancy. You name it, we we'll do it. It's um, volunteering, but confidence is key at the moment. Just one of the people Stuart's helped encourage back into employment is Alan, who's working as a groundkeeper at Hythe Football Club. I lost my way a little and they helped me. You know what I mean? Pushed me in that right direction, encouraged me, gave me the confidence. That's what I was lacking, confidence, you know? So I sort of, I put myself out there and things have been great ever since. I love doing it, I really do. I'm really passionate about it. Before every match, I go up onto the balcony and I take a little video of the pitch when it's looking nice. And uh, I share it on LinkedIn. And over the past four years or so, I've built up quite a big group of people on LinkedIn that are all head groundsmen. Someone up in London spotted the video, spotted that I copied their pitch and asked me if I would like to go and work there. So I applied and got the job. So now I'm a match day groundsman for a major club in London. But with unemployment forecast to reach 2.6 million by the middle of this year and the furlough scheme due to end in April, those still searching for work could find it rather more difficult to get back in the game. Marcella Whittingdale with our report. Joining us from East Sussex to discuss what you've just seen is Stuart Lewis, who runs Restless. It's an employment website for the over 50s. Um, Alan, lovely of you to join us. Uh, uh, I beg your pardon, <laughs> sorry. I was just going to mention uh, Stuart Allen at the end of the film there, Alan in Hythe. I don't think I have ever heard anyone so proud of their work. It was really uplifting, didn't you think? Absolutely. And I think it's one of the things that when you talk around lack of confidence, as Stuart mentioned earlier there, um, it, people forget the impact that long term unemployment can have on, on self-confidence, actually. And you just see from Alan how passionate he was, mm. how proud he was from, from doing a job that he, he cares about. Your company helps people over 50 back into work. What would you say are the specific challenges they face compared to other age groups? Yeah, and, and I think lack of confidence is one of the things that, um, that Stuart was talking about there. But I think it's crucial to understand what drives that lack of confidence, as in it's kind of, a, to use a medical analogy, it's around treating the symptoms, not the causes of it. Um, and there's, there's a number of other challenges that people face. So, so it's, if you think most FTSE 100 CEOs will be in their 50s or 60s, so it's not when you hit a certain age, you suddenly lose confidence. 
In fact, Shirkshi, it's it's we talk about it in terms of ageism. It's one of the last socially acceptable forms of prejudice. It can really knock people's confidence. That and a, a, a lack of opportunities and accessibility for, for retraining mm. programs. You're calling for more action from the government. They would say um, that they are putting so much effort in, I know in particular, into youth unemployment. Um, what, what makes this, the over 50s and, and their issues, a priority? A absolutely. So the, the numbers are just shocking. Um, so there's 617,000 over 50s claiming universal credit, more than double what it was at this time last year, and shows you how financially precarious mm. many in this, this demographic are. There's an additional 644,000 over 55s on furlough at the moment, so we're concerned there's worse to come. But the single, most, uh, the single statistic we are most concerned about is that people are far more likely to drift into long-term unemployment in their 50s or 60s than younger age groups. And this is important for all of us. So 80% of employment growth in the UK came from the over 50s prior to the pandemic. Mm. Unless we have a recovery that's working for all age groups, there won't be a recovery. And that's where we're, we're calling on more to be done in, in this, this sector of the economy. But do you want some of the resources that are being targeted at young people for whom this is a, a, a really catastrophic issue and who are going through all sorts of other problems during the pandemic as well? Do you want those resources diverted? Or do you think there's you know, shake the old money tree and, and there's some more money somewhere. Where, 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 does, where does it all come from? Yeah, absolutely. The most important thing is that we don't pit young against old, actually. If it, for all of the challenges around um, kind of intergenerational fairness and so on, I think the, the pandemic has actually brought, it, brought everyone together, which is fantastic. Um, I think there's a number of things that the government could do, and some of it is piggybacking off existing legislation. It doesn't even have a cost. So you could talk around driving awareness of this. So you have gender pay gap reporting, which excludes small companies because you don't want the red tape, but there is limits around. You could ask companies to disclose their age breakdown, and I guarantee that will get it onto the radar for many, many HR professionals across the country. You can talk around retraining programs. So the kick and, and for example, the Kickstart is a brilliant program and it offers a real incentive for employers to hire younger workers. Why wouldn't that simply be mm. extended to people at the other end of the age spectrum to offer kind of later life apprenticeships the same opportunity? Okay. Let's put this to our politicians. Stay with us. Uh, Lloyd Russell Moyle, and the idea there that there, there shouldn't be a discrimination. You should be able to offer an apprenticeship to somebody, apprenticeship to somebody of any age. What do you think? Well, uh, the Labour Party, of course, did talk about a, a national education service and lifelong learning, free for everyone, at the point of delivery in the last manifesto. And for many reasons, we, we, we didn't get elected on that. But I do think there is a point to come back to uh, some of that. Uh, when I worked uh, briefly for the Commonwealth, and I received, in fact, a commendation from, from the Palace about it, my work was about trying to make those interlinkages between older and younger workforces and people who often share very much the same issues at the beginning of your working life and at the end of your working life. So I think there are some programs that can often be even shared uh, between the two and, and that would be very useful and, and even getting younger and older people together to share skills. But the reality is that everyone in our economy is suffering mm. and it needs better workers' protections and better ability for people to be able to be supported during this time, not a bonfire of workers' protections um, to allow people to work more hours and uh, to be able to be hired and fired more easily, which the Conservative okay. Party until last week was proposing. Crispin, let me come to you. If Wikipedia serves me correctly, you are in your 50s. So this is, you're exactly the age group, the age group we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you're exactly the age group we're talking about here. And you've probably got lots of friends in that age group. Do, would you worry about them? Would you worry about what it felt like in your 50s to suddenly find yourself unemployed? Um, everyone would. And particularly because the uh, the skills required in, in the modern economy seem to change at greater pace uh, than, they, than they used to. And people have different career patterns now than they had when I you know, set out in life aged 18. Um, I was expecting to be a career soldier until 55. Now, uh, life turned out uh, differently for me, but I think uh, in th those times, people might well expect to have uh, a one principal uh, profession for their entire uh, career. And that is not today's pattern. And that means that reskilling during your lifetime um, becomes more important. So the opportunity for uh, 
apprenticeships as you call them, in later life becomes more important mm. and, the, and the need to continue to sustain your skill set for uh, a changing and dynamic modern economy again uh, becomes more important to have that opportunity uh, if you need it and I, I think that the uh, job center plus uh, they have done uh, uh, seeing the support that they provide to people has improved very considerably mm. in the last uh, in, the, in the last few years. May, may, the, I, the, may the, I put yours the, in the, the quality of the quality of the individual support to people? I think is a great deal better than it used to be. May I just put your yes. points back back to our guest? Uh, what, what do you make, Stuart, of what you're, you're hearing there from the politicians, and what do you want them to take on board? I, I think absolutely. So I, I agree with both of the thesis around we need to have uh, nationwide reskilling, nationwide accessibility pro programs for people of all ages to continue to invest in it. I think the point that I would make is there is a real urgency around this. So the, co the confidence factor, you are far better off giving pe getting people into programs as soon as they are made redundant, not waiting until they become into long-term unemployment. Mm when confidence has already been knocked, it becomes much harder to get people back into the workplace there. So these training programs need to come fast and they need to um, they need to be aimed very soon into the redundancy process. I think the other point that we can't shy away from is there's an urgency around state pension age increasing. So in the last recession of 2009, women could retire at 60 and claim the state pension. Today it is 66. That is a big change in 10 years. And actually these training programs are urgent because okay. without them, the, the risk of long-term unemployment will persist potentially decades for people. Stuart, thank Can you I very much you indeed. Training? I know you've got your finger up and it's incredibly endearing, but we haven't got, we must move on to our next. <laughs> I can <book>. try. <laughs> <laughs> nice try indeed.